Kamijo Terma became a wanted criminal across the entire planet simply because he swore to protect and save the life of one girl. And he was willing to declare war upon all of the Earth's population to achieve this. But it was not just any girl. It was a literal magic god known as Ophanus, who had previously tormented Toma in billions of hells, which I talk about in this video on screen right now. Although, if you go watch that one, make sure you come back here and finish the story. By the way, Ophanus is the anime gender-bent version of Odin, if you hadn't figured that out already. Terma's mental state was still intact, and he had aged more than numbers I can count. But many challenges awaited him in New Testament Volume 10, as he faced a boss rush of earth-shattering proportions. After the world was restored, Terma escaped with Ophanus from Sargasso, using her bone boat. But Ophanus is now slowly dying due to the fairy spell that hit her before she destroyed the world. In order to save Ophanus, Terma must take her to Denmark, to Egerskov Castle, where in Mimir's spring, Ophanus sacrificed her right eye to become a magic god. If this other eye is retrieved from the spring and is reinserted into her, then she would become a human once more, which would save her life from the spell. Also, Ophanus can't use magic, as that would speed up the process of her death. Terma vows to battle the entire world to save Ophanus, as he also becomes a wanted criminal worldwide, for assisting her, as no one else knows what happened between them. Academy City send Accelerator, the strongest Esper, who loses on purpose to Toma to hopefully prompt Academy City that sending anyone else after him would be pointless. Accelerator truly taking an L for the team. What a legend. Then the Roman Catholic Church sends some nuns after Toma, but he makes a swift escape. The two continue onwards as they are confronted now by Sasha and Vasilisa of the Russian Orthodox Church, with the Patriarch Kranz using a spell against Terma which backfires, causing the Russians to retreat while Terma is knocked out by another opponent. He then wakes up to be surrounded by the representatives from the land of tea and crumpets. Ah yes, Britain. Kanzaki, Aqua, Night Leader and Carissa in a floating fortress known as Hotel Ariel. And Terma says, screw this, I'm out of here, jumping out the fortress while tumbling down to the surface, banking that Kanzaki would rescue his ass. Kanzaki then protects him from the others on the surface, while Terma and Ophanus bail. The duo then come across Marianne, who is annoyed Ophanus didn't make her dream reality come true with her powers. And so Marianne summons gods and shit using a sword known as Dane's Left, but Terma destroys it and saves Marianne from getting hit by her own summoned god, bringing the fight to an end. Terma is then captured by the US military, presumably for storing so many lollies in his apartment, and he is directly put on the phone to the greatest president of all time. Sorry Donald, it's Roberto Casse. Terma attempts to explain the situation to him, and killing Ophanus would be a mistake. The two are let go, but they are now confronted by numerous Five Overs, machines which each are modelled after level 5 espers with their advanced weaponry. As they attempt to make an escape, the machines are hacked as Misaka Makoto enters the fray. But what does Thomas Stalker want this time? This girl needs a restraining order. Misaka wants answers from her not-so-secret crush about why he is helping a wanted criminal. Terma tells her the world was destroyed, but then there was another world where everyone was happy, warranting a reaction from Misaka, thinking this guy has gone crazy. Terma admits he selfishly destroyed the happiness of the Earth's population by wanting his own world back, but Misaka's like, nah, who would want to live in a paradise where your past mistakes and sins don't exist? Since Misaka herself would rather learn the lesson of giving her DNA map away, causing the creation and deaths of thousands of her clones, then that be altered in a twisted way to create a false sense of happiness. Man, this is deep. Thanks to the reverse talk no jitsu of Misaka, Toma is shook and she defeats him for the first time via hug. Plus, Toma no longer blames himself now for wanting to go back to his reality thanks to this. He later wakes up and is given permission to continue without the stalker following him anymore. The next problem in the way is Birdway and Index, who come up with a great idea. Let's recreate the weapon that destroyed the world two volumes ago, with no possible way to restore the world if we do use Gungnir and threaten someone with it. I swear the characters in Index come up with the worst plans of all time. 
Anyway, Toma prioritizes stopping Index, whose singing was supporting Birdway's version of Gongnia, and in typical Toma fashion, accidentally touches her chest, causing her to scream and the lance to break. Never change Toma, never change. Toma and Offenus are then confronted by Oleris, Brunhild, and Sylvia. Oleris being the guy who has a personal vendetta against Offenus for taking away his opportunity to become a magic god for herself. Toma gets beaten the shit out of him by Oleris's Yandere girlfriend Sylvia, while Brunhild is about to kill Offenus, going against Sylvia's sadistic wish to make Offenus suffer a long and painful death. However, the plot is twisted as Oleris, the man who should want revenge against Offenus, intervenes, knocking out both of the saints at the cost of breaking his arms by the sheer force. He explains to Offenus and Toma that Toma already did his job for him by defeating Offenus, and that killing her would turn Toma into a true monster. I wonder if that's foreshadowing for a future arc. Nah, Kamachi doesn't kill major characters. But yeah, Oleris spares them as they are given permission to advance. They finally arrive at Mimir's Spring. At the top of a strange hill of bodies sits the next boss, Thor. Not that one, the one that looks like a chick. He has just defeated the entirety of Offenus's former organization, Gremlin, single-handedly. He challenges Toma as his next opponent. Thor has nothing against Toma or even Offenus as her former subordinate. He just cares about fighting worthy challenges because he's based. Taika Waititi, take notes. Thor activates his almighty form, which allows him to rotate the entire planet in order to move him to the right position where he's best suited to win, giving the illusion of teleportation. Toma has no chance of hitting him and gets his ass beat until Toma distracts Thor, leading him to getting hit by a train. Another stupid L, but whatever. Thor is badly injured and concedes, giving Toma the victory as often as prepares to retrieve her eye. However, Offenus begins to doubt herself. Does a person like her truly deserve to be saved in this moment, after the acts of terrorism she has caused, in addition to exposing Toma to endless suffering, and erasing everything that existed in the universe? Eh, probably not. So she says, I don't need no man, as she rejects her chauvinistic hero, and starts to use her crossbow magic, knowing that it will result in her death. Gee, after all that effort Toma went, taking her across Denmark in the freezing cold, getting his ass beat multiple times, and nearly getting killed, and when they finally arrive, this is how Offenus treats Toma? Well, that fucking sucks. No wonder he has bad luck. Toma has to avoid hundreds of magical crossbows, so powerful that even just one of them can destroy a planet. He states that Offenus should live with her sins, and even a person like her deserves happiness. Ain't that sweet? Despite Offenus's godlike power, the billions of times Toma fought Offenus in the previous volume comes in handy as he's able to anticipate and dodge her attacks as he closes in. Instead of giving Offenus the classic gender equality treatment in the form of a right hook to the face, Toma gives her a big old hug, saying, I've won Offenus. Her body then crumbles into light as she states that he saved her and thanks Toma for not giving up on her. I'm not crying, I swear. Meanwhile, it's revealed that other magic gods exist and are just endlessly chilling with nothing to do in an alternate dimension separate from the physical world, known as the Hidden World. They are kinda like the Shinigami from Death Note in that regard. However, their peace doesn't last forever, as Alistair Crowley invades the Hidden World, saying he waited for the right opportunity to attack them and was actually aware the world was destroyed prior. Alistair basically wants revenge against the gods and magic as a whole, as he blames them for the premature death of his daughter, but that's another story entirely. Anyway, the gods and the Phantom Man clash, as the hidden world is destroyed in the process. Back to Toma, as he's now in hospital, but he's not alone, as Psyche, Offenus, is still alive, but not without cost. She's now only 15 centimeters tall, as she's now been downgraded from a literal god to a generic fantasy sidekick that can get overpowered by a domestic cat. She survived as Toma's Imagine Breaker, which negates supernatural powers, had cancelled the fairy spell within Offenus, stopping it from completing the killing process, but still turning her into a fairy. Toma then tells her, you must forever watch the world of happiness you went far as suicide to look away from. That is the greatest punishment humanity can give you now, that we have achieved victory over a magic god. 
as New Testament Volume 10 ends. The Ophanus arc is arguably the greatest in the entire Toraru franchise, so I hope you enjoyed this summary, and if you'd like to see more index or unique anime related content on the channel, then please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time. Bye bye.